Hello! I'm finally streaming. I've been working on this all freaking day. How are you guys? I'm finally working on this. It's been like forever. It has taken me all day to get this done. So I'm going to load up the restream chat. Um, let me see if I can get Facebook on board here just in a second. Uh, I have to move this over here. You guys don't want to see that. Ugh, what are you doing? <laughs> Technology is always fun, isn't it? Mm. Let's see how this goes. It's fetching the video stream. So I'm pulling up this restream chat here shortly. So, and I'm able to go on Facebook now, which is really, really cool. So let me see if I can pull up the chat on Restream. It's taking forever a little bit, but we'll get there. I'm probably cutting into a lot of my bandwidth. How are you guys? I hope you're doing well. Um, this is going to be a pretty hefty topic, and it's probably going to be a pretty, um, it's going to be a very involved chat of what we're going to talk about in regards to gun violence. Um, let me see. I'm going to just close out one of a whole bunch of these windows because I have a substantial amount of sources, but um, I think that's going to be a lot. So Restream is still having a hard time loading up. So let me see if I can this over here. I hope you guys are doing well. It's taken forever for me to get my chat to load, so please have patience with me. So today we're going to talk about um, gun violence. If I can get this to stop hopping over there. There we go. There's my chat. It's slowly catching up. It's taken forever. And I think I closed out the other crazy amount of windows that were going on. Um, so, uh, let me pull up on my phone and see what's going on with that and make sure you guys are able to see me there. Um, yeah, it looks like it's popped up on Periscope, so I can see you guys. Hello! Hello, hello! Okay, I see everyone! Okay. Let me... <laughs> hello! I am streaming on YouTube as well, so that's the thing that's kind of cool about um, what I do. I use a service called Restream, and I'm able to see you guys. Hello! I'm able to see you guys on YouTube and on, um, and on Periscope. I'm pulling up Facebook right now on my phone because I, I don't have access to those chats there except through my phone app. So. If you're um, watching me on Facebook, I'm trying to coordinate between my phone <laughs> and all of this other stuff that's going on. Woohoo! So, um, this is a pretty hefty topic. Um, and I know it's, it's highly sensitive right now. And it's, it's kind of scary. So, what I thought I would do is talk a little bit about... Um, gun violence and what's going on with that. Um, let me turn my phone down on here so in case anybody hops on, I can see you on Facebook. So, um, all right. I think I've closed out the monster amount of windows that I had before. So, um, so I've spent like two days <laughs> two whole days working on this particular topic. I've had about 40 sources 
Hello everyone. I've had about 40 sources associated with that, so I'll have to update you with all of my sources. I am going to touch on a few of them here uh, in regards to what my, where I get my statistics, what the numbers are, everything in regards to that. Um, this is a pretty, pretty um, upsetting topic. It can be a bit scary. Hello everyone. Hello. And the thing is, is this is, this is not a pleasant subject. It's not like we're talking about dark matter. We're not really talking about happy things, you know, cool stuff, photosynthesis, woo! This is gun violence. And the thing is, the science made guns and science studies gun trends. So let's go ahead and get started. That's a pretty cool intro. Gonna go for it. Made that for me. Ooh, that was in an earthquake. That was my knee hitting my desk. <laughs> Woohoo! Um, yeah, you hate the term gun violence. Well, I mean, you know, it's kind of like how we see. Sorry, I'm moving you guys over. Gun violence. You know, we have car violence. We have all kinds of different types of violence. Um, but it's kind of how that goes. Um, you know, it's violence associated with guns. It's, you know, nobody likes the term violence. It's not something that's, that's fun. Yeah, that's one of my openings. That's one of my opening things. So, um, so I thought since I have like for real, there's so much information available in regards to the statistics in the U.S. for, um, guns, gun crimes, all the different laws and stuff. So <sighs> I've done a lot of footwork and a lot of studying and stuff like that. Well, if a woman stabs her husband, is it knife violence? Yeah, it's still knife violence. That's yeah. Violence with a knife. I mean, we have specific types of violence that are associated with different crimes. Um, for instance, if you're robbing a bank and you have a weapon involved, that's a whole different type of crime now, isn't it? You know, it, it, it has a whole bit of intention associated with that, the intent to, you know, and then we have terrorism, what, what constitutes terrorism. So we have a lot of different things that we associate with whether or not a weapon is involved in a particular thing. So what I thought I would do today is talk about the different things associated with gun violence. Now, these are just a few of my sources. These are just a few. I have about 40 different sources, anywhere from news articles, um, but these are kind of like the raw statistics where I get a lot of the stuff. There's um, a journal about violence and gender, and there's some articles that have been published there. FAS.org, PewResearch.org, they do a lot of work, especially associated with surveys about public perception of things, including gun ownership. The National Institute of Justice, everytownresearch.org, gunviolence.org, which is, it keeps up with all of the current trends associated with, um, with you know, gun violence in the U.S. They, they focus primarily in the U.S. Um, gun violence and mental illness, that's a whole paper. Uh, mental illness, mass shootings, and the politics of American firearms. Mental illness and reduction of gun violence and suicide, bringing epidemiologic research to policy, federal firearms pro um, prohibition, um, section 18 USC, G2, uh, 922G4. We're, I'm going to talk about that. Um, let's see, federal firearms, yeah, I talk about, and then the lawcenter.giffords.org. That's a really good resource, especially if you kind of get caught up in the jargon in regards to background checks, what states require what type of thing in association with guns, you know, who allow, who requires licensing, are we talking about concealed carry, um, what are the background checks, what do they entail? That's so, the lawcenter.giffords.org is a very easy to read website if you kind of get lost a bit in the jargon. Oh yes, there's suicide is on the rise, um, which is actually a, a very sad thing. So, um, here, let me shrink myself a bit because I'm overlapping 
on these topics here. All right, so things that I'm gonna cover today in this particular topic are statistics, who are gun owners, and what are their perceptions in regards to gun ownership. Um, how, what is gun ownership? What can you do in regards to guns? I mean, what? how do you get a gun, that sort of thing? What are the laws? We're gonna also talk about the mental illness myth. We're gonna talk about mass shooters and their MO. AR-15s, why do people use them? Why do they like them? What makes them so appealing? The NRA has a lot of information as to what makes AR-15s a lot of fun. So if you've not checked out their blog, you can read that. Boy, that's a wild ride. Then we have other countries and their perceptions of things. Politicians and solutions. Oh yeah, the musket commercial. You know, our founding fathers were in a different time. Um, so, and I will talk about the Second Amendment and the varying um, perspectives in regards to the well-regulated militia and looking at, you know, uh, an oppressive government trying to overthrow us. What does that really mean? You know, what, what are we looking at when we're thinking about that? So I'm going to cover a lot of these things. So these are kind of the topics that I'm going. Um, I will compile a list of all of my sources so you can hop on. And, and kind of dig down further and kind of see where these numbers go. Um, let's see. Oh, gosh, yeah, I heard that there's another show going on. I wasn't thinking about this. Um, so I, I wasn't, I did not plan so well. See, my, my academic brain's like, I have to have this extra time. And then I'll hop on and then I'll like do these things. <laughs> ISP is giving you a hassle. So this is these are the topics that I'm going to cover because I feel like this is where we kind of have to have this dialogue. What are the statistics? Hello, everyone. Hello. I'm so glad you could pop on. I know I'm like a day and hours late compared. Normally I do this Saturday mornings, but I wanted to make certain I had as much information as I could and we could have a good thorough discussion about this problem we see here in New Jersey is criminals obtaining guns outside of the legal method. We have a fairly stringent process for legal gun owners. I bet. Yeah. When you talk about the percent of mass shootings that occur in gun-free zones, I'm not certain about those. I haven't looked at that so much. Um, <laughs> so, all right. Hello. So let's go ahead and let me see. I've spent a lot of time on this. <laughs> If I can get my screen to go to the next one, it doesn't want to do that. Ah, there we go. So the first thing I'm going to do is talk about um, the statistics. All right. And this comes to us from, let me pull up my source here. Hello. <laughs> so this comes to us from um, gunviolence.org, I believe is what it is. Um, let me see. Was that the previous one? Yeah, I already talked about it. So this one comes to us from gunviolence.org. Uh, so the total incidents, okay, this is just for 2018. Okay, this is just since January. And you can go to this website and kind of see it for yourself. Um, but we've already had 7,009 gun incidents. There's already been over 7,000 in incidents and we're just in our second month. Um, and out of these 7,000 incidents, we've got 1,935 deaths, 3,342 injuries, 71 children are injured or killed already in 2018. Um, the number of teens are 379. Um, we've had 32 mass shootings. There have been 41 officers shot or killed. And then there's been 312 officer-involved shootings of a suspect where they were shot or killed. There have been 285 home invasions and 229 unintentional shootings. Um, yes, yeah, so we, ha you know, and if you're a gun owner, you know, <laughs> that's okay. I'm, I'm not here to hate on gun owners. I just want to talk about the very real issue we have associated with, um, individuals who are gaining access to guns who really shouldn't have them and the fact that we have um, semi-automatic assault rifles and, and the kind of problems that are associated with that. Um, so 
again, this is from gunviolencearchive.org. That's the previous statistics. Now, these particular statistics, I want you to keep in mind, this particular website posts all the links to all the incidents. So they're not just making phone calls to various, you know, they, they, they search different crime databases as well as reports from media, but they post all of their links. So you can actually go and click on where these particular incidents have occurred, even down to the address. They'll even tell you um, where these incidents happened. So this is a pretty reputable site. So gunviolencearchive.org. So far in 2018, these are the incidents, and these are over 7,000 incidents in just the past two months. Um, so we kind of have a, a bit of a graphic here of all of the statistics that I just told you a little bit ago. So the next one, the number of, oh, sorry, previous slide. I jumped too far, I jumped too far ahead. All right, so the number of deaths in 2018. So these particular deaths, there's the number of deaths in 2018. Um, hold on, did I have notes associated with the previous one? I think I did. Let's see. I think I did. I'm going to kind of go back to the previous slide if I can. Did I have notes? Nope, no notes. Okay. I was jumping ahead of myself. All right, so these are the number of deaths already associated with 2018. So we've had over 7,000 incidents. Um, we've had thousands in deaths and injuries. Um, we've had a big old chunk of those be teenagers. Um, and then we, you know, I also did talk a little bit about the officer related shootings. Now I want you to take a look at this image. This is just in the last 72 hours. All right. In the last 72 hours, and this shows, um, on this particular map, and this is an interactive map that you can go to on gunviolence.org. They, uh, they update it regularly. So in the past 72 hours, according to this map, we show that there's 172 incidents of gun violence, both civilian and officers. Now this is shown on the map. If you go to the actual report that they have, there's a comprehensive list that you can download into an Excel file. You download this Excel file, it goes up to 249 incidents. Yes, this is live, with 71 people already killed and 139 injured in just three days. This is just three days. Yes, we are live, if you're wondering. So this is just three days. We've already had 71 people killed since, you know, February 15th and 139 injuries. So it's, it's pretty scary. You can absolutely participate. This is, <laughs> if you're new to this, you can interact with me. I have you on Facebook Live. I also have you on Periscope and I have you on YouTube. How many muggings, home invasions, and rapes with no gun involved in the last 72 hours? Now that's the thing. You have to go to the website and I downloaded the Excel spreadsheet. They can actually, and you can go to their 72 hours option on gunviolencearchive.org and you can look to see more of the details involved with those particular um, incidents. So this is pretty cool that, that this is kind of like a real time, as close to real time as possible in regards to gun violence. So what's my personal position on gun control? I think we should have gun control to the same level that we have car control and control of other things if we're going to ban kinder ban kinder eggs and lawn darts because kids got hurt we need to kind of go similarly along that with um you know gun violence so let's see it is very complicated um ah if it's more complicated than if everyone is armed it wouldn't happen that's not actually true i mean arming people hasn't really solved the problem um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about legislation that's come and gone and how that's actually increased sales of AR-15s. All right. So let's take a look at the rate of gun ownership in the U.S. So this, I believe, was as of two, 2013. So this is gun ownership by state by state. If you notice, we have a high amount of gun ownership in this lower area. If we go back to that other map, in 2018, you know, of current 2018, let's hop over there. Let me get back there. So that's the number of deaths. Notice we have a high rate of deaths and incidents 
in the same area where we have a large amount of gun ownership. Let me go back to that particular map for you. Here we go. The darker the red, the more the guns. So uh, yeah, we do have a large amount here, but I don't think this is as densely populated as it is in these particular areas. All right. <laughs> so, so far, what we're talking about, we've talked about the current statistics just since January 1. We've talked about um, where you can find the latest information in regards to gun violence. And now I should say, um, mass shootings. Now, if you go to gun control, gun um, violence archive .org, their, their particular definition of mass shooting is anything that involves four or more people, not including the gunman. All right. So a mass shooting is anything involving four or more people, not including the gunman, him or herself. Usually it's him. We're also going to talk about that. So Let's talk a bit about um, a few other things. Oh God, I can't imagine if everybody was armed. That would be pretty crazy. All right, so gun violence. <laughs> I should point out that there is a solid link between assault rifles and mass shootings. While handguns are still used in what we would call one-on-one -on -one types of crimes, and we can see that you know, when, when we're dealing with police and criminals and armed robberies and that sort of thing. Um, assault rifles, assault, assault rifles ha have become the trend we see associated with the more recent mass shootings, including Sandy Hook, Parkland, Aurora Theater, and the um, Orlando nightclub. The AR-15 has been the most recent in use of mass shootings, and we're going to talk a little bit about why it might be that the AR-15 is the weapon of choice. So this is something that we, we kind of need to have this discussion on. What is it about the AR-15 that makes it a choice weapon for individuals um, who perpetrate those in engage in these mass shootings? It's actually kind of scary. Um, so let's first talk about gun owners. <laughs> All right, so Pew Research. Pew Research does a lot of work, especially when it comes to American perception of various things, including um, gun ownership. I've, I've used them before in talks in regarding um, online harassment. So about four in 10 U.S. adults say they live in a gun-owning household. Now there's 57% of US of the US adults live in a household with no guns. So the majority of people in the US do not have guns. 30% own guns. 11% currently own a gun but live with uh, currently um, don't own a gun but live with somebody who does. So um <laughs> I was just wondering why the AR-15. Yeah, we'll talk about that. There's reasons for that. And so there's also a percentage of about 48% grew up in a household with guns. 59% say at least some of their friends own guns. And 72% have shot a gun. So we have a substantial amount of gunness going on in the U.S. So this is something that's 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 here and it's inherently part of the American culture. And it's something that we kind of also need to address as well. As you know, it's, it's kind of a thing that we romanticize a lot of. We see it in our films. We see it as part of almost like a, you know, especially some individuals in the South see it as I've got to take my, my child hunting. I'm going to buy them their own gun at Walmart. And if I have a girl, I'll get her a pink camouflage one, you know, and it's child size. It's just, it's, it's really interesting that it's a part of this American culture, almost like some people see it as a rite of passage. And, you know, we don't necessarily have to get rid of all the guns, but we certainly need to kind of take a step back and go, okay, when is it too much? You know, when is it at a point to where we're going, okay, we we don't need a gun bender. It's not like, you know, you know drinking too much alcohol. We, we don't necessarily need a gun bender either. So we got to kind of look at it um, objectively at some point. So let's look at this next one. All right. 
So, so there's a lot of gun ownership and, and a lot of gun owners cite owning a gun as part of their American rights, you know, and I will talk a bit about this too. Um, they, they see it as just as important as free speech. Now, most gun owners, the reason why they have guns, 67% say it's for protection. Protection from what is my question, but that's okay. We're going to talk about the Second Amendment here in a bit. 38% um, say it's for hunting. 30% say it's for sport shooting. 13% as part of a gun collection. There's a Hello Kitty assault rifle. I believe that. <laughs> and then you have some that have it, you know, and you, you can have like a gun collection. Maybe you like Civil War type of stuff, you know, Old West type of collections. And then you have about 8%, only 8% of gun owners own a gun because of their job. To me, that's a little bit striking, but that's me. But 67% say they own it for some kind of personal protection. All right, so here's where I was talking about um, in regards to this American concept of you owning gu a gun is just as important as your freedom of speech. So this is the percent saying that each is essential to, essential to their own sense of freedom. So gun owners equate freedom of speech it's 94% as to owning a gun. It's a part of their freedom. Almost as much as their right to vote, their right to privacy, freedom of religion. Now here's where we get a divide. 74% of gun owners say that owning a gun, they should have a right to own guns and only 35% of non-gun owners agree with this. So that means just almost as many as people who don't own guns as do completely are just divided on whether or not this is essential to their freedom. So we have a stand your ground law in Florida. Arm break-ins down a lot over the last year. Hmm. That's pretty interesting. So we have um, a lot of this culture where Americans associate owning a gun as just as essential and an integral part of their freedom, just as much as freedom of speech. So <laughs> when we're looking at the dialogue we have to have with guns, and I kind of talk about this a little bit in regards to discussing evolution with people who are science resistant, um, you have to take into consideration that people hold like a core essential part of themselves and tie themselves into um, their gun ownership as something that's part of their, you know, their freedom. And, and so we kind of have to dissect it a bit and, and kind of step back and go, okay, why do we really have these guns? Why, you know, is it patriotic? Is this sense of nostalgia? People grew up with them. It's, you know, is it like hot dogs and apple pie? You know, so when, when you're having gun discussions, it's exceedingly important to understand a lot of people feel that this is part of their freedom, not necessarily because it really in reality is, that, that may not be the case at all, and I, I, I don't think it is, but in their minds, it's exceedingly important. So you have to navigate those waters kind of, you know, delicately and understand that these people find it to be extremely important. It used to be so we could stand up to government corruption, but we can do that with military advances anymore. The reason it was a right no longer exists. Yeah, and I'm going to talk a bit about that. So we do need to kind of address everything. And this is a hard topic, especially given what's happened um, with Parkland in recent times. Um, so essentially, yeah, some say, you know, some people think, it's a God-given right to be able to have a gun. They see it as to, to protect yourself. I'm going to talk about the NRA too, so don't worry. We're going to hit a lot of points here. We're going to talk about the politics associated with, um, with guns. Okay, so in regards to gun owners, gun or owners and non-owners, this again is, is from Pew Research, um, have differing views on the severity of gun violence. And so when we're looking at gun violence, we, we, see, we see vastly differing perceptions of it from people who own guns and people who don't own guns. Half of Americans 
say gun violence is a very big problem in the United States. Now these are numbers from 2017. So all of this research is just from last year, so it's still very fresh. All right, so 59% see gun violence as a very big problem in the country today. This is as of 2017. It's probably much larger than that now, especially with the outrage of Parkland. Only a third of adults who own guns say the same. So one third of all of the gun owners in the U.S. say that gun violence is a big problem. The other two thirds don't have a problem with it. So we kind of have to address this cognitive dissonance, this disconnect where people who own guns, and then again, this, is, this was just last year, we're talking a few months ago when this Pew Research came out from 2017, people, only two thirds of gun owners do not think that there's a gun problem, all right? 86% say the ease of people legally, illegally obtaining gun con, guns contributes to a fair amount of the gun um, violence. 60% point to the ease with which people can legally obtain guns. So we have, there are people who are obtaining guns illegally and the majority of people say that that's a problem. 60% say it's just entirely too easy for people to gain access to guns. Now, two thirds of non-gun owners, okay, so that's about 67%, see illegally obtained guns as a contributing factor to gun violence compared with the fewer 44% of gun owners. So less than half of gun owners don't see, I mean, less than half of gun owners see a problem with illegally obtained guns. The majority of them are completely fine with it. So. That's kind of where we're, we're stuck a bit in regards to this. Um, so we kind of have to address this with the fact that a lot of gun owners don't think there is a problem. They don't think there is a problem. So we kind of have to look at the big picture here. What it is, what is it that we're talking about? All right. So um, now I kind of want to address the mentally ill myth. We've heard a lot of news in regards to people who are mentally ill. We see, oh, well, the latest shooter, he was a troubled youth. Um, and then we have the guy who shot up the church. He was a troubled person. He had a mental problem. Um, and then we have the Orlando shooter. He had a mental problem. And then we have the Sandy Hook pe person. He had a mental problem. Now, it's actually not the case. Um, so these are these particular statistics, um, and I will I'll quote these for you. These are from NAMI.org, N-A-M-I.org, um, and there's actually there's actually one one of the books that I quoted earlier on talk about the um, 235 mass killings. So the the National Justice, I believe the National Justice, I forget institution posted um, a report and um, psychologists have picked a part and of the 235 mass killings, I believe since 1998, only 22% are considered mentally ill. Only 1% of mass shootings can be considered caused by the mentally ill. Now, technically speaking, there is federal law that requires that requires, uh, prohibits the sales of guns to people who have been committed. So if you've been committed to an institution for any particular severity of mental illness, that prevents you from getting a gun. All right. But there are loopholes. I'm going to talk about those. Um, barring sales to convicted, crim convicted criminals is more effective. Um, so if we're able to stop convicted criminals from being able to gain access to weapons, whether it be for, you know, hard drug problems, um, that was the, the church shooter. He had a history of drug addiction and they call that a mental illness. Well, addiction can be, I suppose, to a degree, but that's on a record. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the loophole that allowed him to be able to get a gun. Um, are you saying if you kill, um, mass people. Well, here's the thing. If you know what you're doing and you premeditate it, you're making a choice to do it. That's saying. Insanity is not understanding that what you have done is wrong and you didn't plan it. 
all these mass shootings have been premeditated. Um, only 4% of violence is actually associated with mental illness. Now, here's another thing we got to look at. Uh, the World Health Order has put out reports, especially in regards to mental illness, that we see across the world. The U.S., Americans have the same amount of mental illness as any other country, but we don't see the same level of mass shootings in, now I'm not talking about third world countries, I'm talking about wealthy countries. We don't see the level, the same level of mass shootings amongst the wealthier countries, the first world countries that suffer relatively the same amount of mental illness as Americans. Um, less than 5% of gun relating killings are by the mentally ill. And then again, I do mention that federal law prohibits the sales already of guns to people who have been committed for various types of severe mental illness. And so we kind of have to take a second to go, okay, <laughs> we already have federal law in place that's supposed to prevent individuals who have severe mental illness from gaining access to weapons. So, you <laughs> If you um, premeditate, okay, well, here's the thing. This is why we have psychologists and psychiatrists to be able to determine whether or not somebody knew what it is that they're doing wrong. Evil and hating people is not insanity. That's just evil and hating people. I mean, we have Nazis that were completely sane, walking children to gas chambers because they were just following orders. We have the Milgram experiment to show us that people are in, are capable of inherently evil things and make the choice to continue on because they can pass the buck off to somebody else. So insanity and doing evil acts, they're not necessarily hand in hand. I mean, if you're interested, you should go and check out the Milgram experiment as well as um, the Stanford prison experiment to show you that people when they're in positions of power, if they're able to do horrible things and get away with it, they absolutely will. Psychology has taught us this and we have the American Psychological Association that kind of stepped up after the Stanford experiment because that caused a lot of um, damage to individuals who were subjected to that particular type of torture. So um, you submit that anyone who kills people randomly in mass is severely mentally disturbed and deserving of the electric chair. Well, that's the thing. Um, that's why we have experts to sit there and say, do they understand that they were killing people? Yes or no? Did they understand that what they were doing is wrong? And so that's kind of where you have to kind of draw that line. You have people, if you go and look at the Milgram experiment that walked away, they're like, yeah, I'm not going to do this anymore. And if you're unfamiliar with the Milgram experiment, I'll explain it to you. They had people that were actors and they had people that were, um, they were testing on. So essentially they had a person that pretended to be a scientist that was sitting in a room with another person. And that person was asking questions to somebody they couldn't see in another room. And if they got the question wrong, they had to administer electric shock, all right? And so they found that the majority of people, and they had to crank it up, crank up the electricity, and they even had markings on the machine to show that there could have been damage done to the person. So these people, a lot, the majority of them continued on the, with the experiment, hearing a person screaming on the other side, they were completely sane. They weren't insane. They initiated what they thought were um, painful and possibly lethal amounts of electricity towards a person that was answering questions wrong. They were just following orders. And this particular experiment came out of the Nazi trials where people were saying that they just were following orders. They weren't insane. They knew what they were doing, but they made a choice because they thought they could pass the buck of responsibility towards the scientist who, at, who anytime they would say, I think I'm hurting this person, the scientist would go, please continue with the experiment. So if there's an authority figure present, they can pass the buck to that authority figure and say, I can continue on with this violence because this other person is here. So um, accountability. 
That's exactly correct. Accountability. So people who commit violent acts aren't all insane. So <laughs> they're not all insane. That's why we have psychologists and psychiatrists to kind of pick apart and they have tests in place to determine whether or not a person knew that what they were doing was wrong. So that's kind of my spiel on just because somebody does something evil doesn't mean they're insane because people do evil things just because they enjoy it. <laughs> All right. So mental illness is not the issue with gun violence. People are mentally ill all over the world and don't commit mass murder. Women in the U.S., we suffer mental illness. And they're not walking into schools and shooting them up. They're not shooting up churches. They're not shooting up clubs or movie theaters. We don't see women committing mass murder. Um, now, with that said, if we're going to say that mental illness is an issue, we also need to say, again, this is from NAMI.org, one in five adults in the U.S. suffers mental illness in some form, whether it be anxiety, depression, something like that. That's one in five. One in five adults in the U.S. suffers mental illness, but yet one in five are not committing mass murders and one in five are not committing suicide. Now, one in 25 experience severe mental illness but are not committing mass murders. So we can't play the mental illness card. We can't do that because it's not a mental illness issue. It's not because you have mentally ill people that aren't going around killing people. And you know, honestly, one in five adults in the U.S. is mentally ill. So we can't, we got to kind of throw that out the window. And people, we already know people who have been committed in, in hospitals for severe mental illness are already marked um, as not being able to purchase guns. So, um, so let's see. Another thing I want to talk about. <laughs> and I will give you access, guys, I'll give you access to all of my um, sources. I've had to close down my screen for that, but I'll get them to you. Um, and I did have some at the beginning of this talk here and there are books and I have posted some on Twitter. It's about half of, well, maybe uh, a, a third of my sources are on there so you can you can check it out. Now, murder is never an, an answer. Um, yeah, and accountability um, needs to be important. All right, so in regards to federal law, all right, what are the loopholes? Because we've got loopholes, don't we? <laughs> All right, so this particular one, I had mentioned, I think it was giffordlaw.org. Um, that website is phenomenal, and it kind of helps break down what the laws are, what the laws are in each state. So you can actually go and check out that website and kind of see whatever state you live in, what those particular laws are. You're welcome. I'm glad I could do this for you. So federal law loopholes. Um, private sale exemption. All right. Unlicensed private sellers are not required to conduct background checks. This means that unless, unless state law requires a background check for these sales, convicted felons, domestic abusers, and other ineligible people can legally buy guns. Now, with that said, 19 states have closed this loophole. So only 19 states have um, dealt with the private sale exemption. So being able to sell a gun to another person out of your own house. Um, only 19 states have closed that loophole. Here's another issue. Now I mentioned the individual who shot up that African-American church. They say he was a troubled young man. Well, he was a drug addict and um, he had, he had convictions. The background check is limited to three days. Um, and what that happens is now 91% of the federal background checks provide an answer within minutes, but sometimes it takes longer. About 9% of cases require additional investigation by authorities and the FBI and ATF agents do that. However, Due to the federal default process, which means that after three days, if there's not an answer heard back from the authorities, the, the gun seller can assume 
that everything's fine and sell a gun to a person. So agents only have three business days to conduct this research if, they, if, if there's an issue and finish their investigation. It's just three days. So this default proceed provision allowed 3,722 prohibited purchases purchasers to buy guns in 2012 before a background check cleared, and it allowed over 2,500 guns to be illegally purchased in 2014 by individuals who would have not cleared a background check. That's a lot. <laughs> That's thousands. That's, we're talking thousands of guns went and were sold because the FBI and the ATF could not complete an investigation within three days. Now, we say that's only 9%, but 9% in the whole of the U.S., given that millions, approximately 5 million people now own an AR-15, according to the NRA, we're talking about thousands when we're getting into single-digit percentages. Um, federal law, another loophole, allows individuals who hold certain firearms-related permits issued by the state or local governments, such as concealed weapons um, and permits, to bypass the federally required background check. So certain permits don't require background checks. So you're able to, <laughs> you're able to just get these guns anyway if you have certain types of permits. Um, so the permits must have been issued within the previous five years in the state in which the transfer is to take place, and two, after an authorized government official has conducted a background investigation to verify that possession of a firearm would not be unlawful. So um, you can kind of hop over some of these um, background checks um, if they've already kind of, you know, had a permit in the past. Um, so <laughs> we have some of these loopholes. Another thing is verification of identity. While each gun purchaser must present proof of identity when applying the, to purchase a firearm, federal law does not provide a mechanism for dealers to ensure that these identification documents are valid. So if you have an ID of some sort, in some states, there's no provision that shows that this is indeed who you are. Um, this gap in the federal background check system allows prohibited individuals to purchase firearms without effective background checks. And they can use fake or forged documents in order to pass and bypass this. So we're looking at identity theft in some case, not only in a credit card form, but now in a firearm form, which is really, really scary, <laughs> if I'm quite honest. Um, so hold on to your information and make sure people don't have access to it. Um, man, so here we are, a well-regulated militia. So this one sentence, the Second Amendment, is the biggest, 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 biggest booger now, isn't it? Um, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Um, so this is where we kind of talk in, a little bit about the Constitution. And there, oh, one of my um, references is if you pick apart, I think it's constitution.org. I think that's what it is. Um, and I'll talk a bit about that and, and as far as the conflicting things, and I can send you a link on that. There's a lot of back and forth as to what this means um, in the Founding Fathers and what they have to say about that. Um, what would they say about assault rifles, assault um, using, you know, using this against our own people? Um, so there's, there's varying... Um, and law professors are arguing about this even now. Um, we got to think about the time that the Second Amendment came out. We didn't have an army. We didn't have a Navy, Marines, Air Force, Coast Guard. We didn't have FBI, CIA, SWAT. We didn't have police. We didn't. We didn't have enough 
individuals where they were organized to where we could raise an army to fight off foreign powers. Um, we have that now. A well-regulated militia being a group of individuals that were regulated by local governments in order to protect their people against foreign invasion. Um, and some people are like, well, what about tyrannical, you know, government? What if our government goes nuts? Well, you know what? What if our government goes nuts? Why in the world? Okay, so let, let's, let's, let's talk about that scenario. What if our government loses their mind? And what if, you know, everybody has to have arms and everybody has to deal with this? All right. Well, first of all, let's talk about 2017. The Supreme Court ruled assault weapons are not covered under the Second Amendment. Mel, can you put the states back up where the red color map? I'm curious to see where Texas stands. Oh, do you mean with the number of killings or do you mean the gun owners? I can put that up. Um, let me go over the Second Amendment and then I'll hop back to that if you want to. Okay. Um, all right. So in 2017, the Supreme Court ruled that assault weapons are not covered under the Second Amendment. This was in an appeals court. We do not need a regulated militia, and most of the regulated militias have dissipated and disbanded anyway. So we really don't even have them anymore. In the very nature of the Constitution, and a lot of people forget that Thomas Jefferson actually had a quote where he discusses the fact that it needs to be able to change as society changes. We don't have slavery anymore because society changed. We allow women to vote because society changes. And so the very nature of the Constitution by the Founding Fathers would allow it to change with society. And I believe Thomas Jefferson said that would be like trying to wear the same coat that you wore when you were a child. We have to progress and grow. All right, so let's talk about protection from the government. All right, so what if we have a tyrannical government? In light of the current Army, Air Force, Navy, Marine, SWAT, Police, CIA, and FBI, they're going to outgun any civilian with any substantial chance of overthrowing a tyrannical government. Now we might have a civil war, but then we're going to have our government divided in half and then we'll have those resources in that regard. But the fact remains, if you're talking about a tyrannical government, do you have any hope of actually overthrowing it with your few guns you have hanging up on your wall over there? Are you going to shoot down a tank? How is that going to go? Even if you keep your gun for homestead protection, an AR-15 semi-automatic rifle is overkill given we are not fighting hordes of people invading our homes and we are not in a zombie apocalypse. So, you know, the militia is a useless feature. And so, <laughs> so it's like, what the heck is going on? All right, so somebody wants to go back and look. Here, I'll hop back then because I want this to be a very interactive talk. And let me get back to, are we talking about the incidents of 2018 or are we talking about the deaths or are we talking about the gun ownership? So let me hop back a bit. Here we go. It's gonna take me a second because I'm a bit far. I'm so glad you guys are here to talk to me about this. I think it's important we have open dialogue and we kind of see it for what it is. You know what I mean? And that we understand that this is something we, we all have to kind of participate in in order to see where this goes. So this is gun ownership as of 2013. And between 30 and 40% of Texas owns a gun. We have more gun ownership um, in the states a little bit more east. But um, now if we're talking about deaths in regards to guns, let me pop that back. That's um, just in the last 72 hours. Um, now let's go back to, this is the number of deaths in 2018. And you notice we have a high amount right around where we see all those gun ownerships right there. Yep. Now, like I said before, you can go to gunviolencearchive.org and you can get the latest information in regards to um, the, the gun um, violence in the past 72 hours. So that's a thing. <laughs> 
Um, not necessarily a happy one, but it is a thing that exists. And it's there for your, um, for your perusal. So you can dive down a bit more and understand a bit what it is that we're dealing with. Um, so let me jump ahead. We've already talked about gun owners. So, so far we've talked about statistics just for this year, okay? We've talked about gun owners and what who they are, all right? We've talked about loopholes in gun ownership. We've talked about the mental illness myth. Um, what else are we talking about? I actually spent a lot of time on this stuff, like two days. <laughs> That's why it took so long. We've talked about the Second Amendment and the well-regulated militia and how this seems a little bit ridiculous to a degree. So I want to finish up on this, on the um, well-regulated militia. All right, so these two individuals, um, and this is one of those, constitute, it's, I think it's the Consti edu constitutioneducation.org. Um, I'll, I'll find the link for you, and I'll post all of my links. I have just spent so much time going through all of this. Thank you. Um, so we have two individuals. We have Nelson Lund, and we have um, Adam Winkler. Now, Nelson Lund is a university professor at the School of Law of George Mason University, um, and Adam Winkler is a professor of law at UCLA. Nelson says, not a second class right, the Second Amendment today by Nelson Lund. And you can get more of the information, the full statement from the website, and I'll provide that to you. The right to keep and bear arms is a lot like the right to freedom of speech in each case. The Constitution expressly protects the liberty that needs to be insulated from the ordinary political process. And so he equates owning a gun. This would be our friend Nelson here. Nelson says you should owning a gun is just like the right the right to say words. Okay, that's what Nelson says. Your right to say words is just as important as your right to own a gun. All right, Adam Winkler here, he says, gun control is as much a part of the Second Amendment as the right to keep and bear arms. The text of the amendment, which refers to a well-regulated militia, suggests, suggests as much. So he says, because it says well-regulated militia, that means we have to have some kind of gun control. If we don't have some kind of gun control, then, you know, what what is what is well regulated mean exactly? And Nelson's like, we should have guns. It's just as important as the right to bear arms. And so this is kind of where we have to have a little bit of this dialogue. Is owning a gun the same as the right to say words? Um, I kind of feel like no, <laughs> because even though I can hurt people emotionally with my words. I'm not necessarily taking their life unless I'm threatening them, okay? When we, when we institute threats towards people, that's not protected by law, is it? If you threaten a person, that's not protected by law. What does a gun do? So we have to go, okay, but people need to protect themselves. But yes, but do they really need assault rifles? Supreme Court says that's not covered under the Second Amendment. So what do you do? <laughs> All right, mass shooters. What are the MOs of mass shooters? So now we're getting to the meat of things. All right, so every mass shooter we've had within recent times has been white in mail. All right. Here's something that's a little bit shocking. There was a report that came out and some American Psychology Association kind of picked it apart you know, and Psychiatry Association picked it apart and they found that 54% of mass shooters have a link to domestic violence between 2009 and 2016. So over half of mass shooters have a link to domestic violence. Now, if they have a link to domestic violence, how is it that they're able to get guns? That's a good question. Um, there are laws that prevent convicted domestic violence offenders from purchasing weapons. Now, here's the thing that a lot of people, here's the thing that a lot of people um, don't understand. The Dallas shooter was not white. Well, send me that information, RSC 227. I would like to hear about that. Um, now, mass shootings, uh, that there's a lot of debate on what constitutes a mass shooting. Um, the gunviolencearchive.org, they report mass shootings as anything 
as four or more people, not including the shooter. Okay. Um, so which one? Yeah, the Dallas shooter. <laughs> okay, so here's a loop in regards to domestic violence. So 54% of the one who killed six police officers. Okay, well, that's fair. Um, that's fair, and that would be considered a mass shooting. I think, I don't know. I think the mass shooting that they were looking at, I think, and see, that's the thing, is are we counting police officers, killing police officers as a mass shooting? I think that would be fair. Um, but we also, uh, is that, you know, are we going to just look at civilians? Um, I missed what you said on white. Did you mention male, female stats too? Yes. Um, every mass shooter of civilians, I'll say civilians, has been white and male. Okay. Um, now, and then I said that 54% of them, and this is a statistic, and I can send you guys a link for that. 54% um, of mass shooters have a link to domestic violence. Um, now, there are laws that prevent domestic violence offenders from purchasing weapons in some states, but there's something that's a phenomenon called the girlfriend loophole, okay? The girlfriend loophole is that girlfriends are not protected by the same laws as spouses and children. So these offenders go unchecked. So if you're just the girlfriend of somebody and you have a domestic violence situation, they're not, they, there's the same laws are, are not applied to girlfriends as they are to um, spouses and children. And mental illness is not associated with mass shootings. I, I believe it's 1% of them are, um, are associated. Um, yeah, domestic violence is totally relevant, however, doesn't count if they're married. That's correct. That's what we call the girlfriend loophole. And unfortunately, that's a thing that exists. Um, and hopefully with a lot of the dialogue we're having with the Me Too movement and um, sexual assault and harassment and things like that are that are coming to light. The more we talk about this and the more that we understand that this is far more prevalent than people realize, we can initiate change and move towards laws that protect girlfriends and other people that um, that in that are involved with this sort of thing. All right, now we're getting to the meat of stuff here. Let's talk about the AR-15. Um, yeah, I mean, the NRA has lobbied against Congress to make it extremely difficult to collect gun violence statistics as well. Yeah, the CDC was not allowed to, for a long time, um, they were not allowed, I think the current head of the CDC is wanting to study um, gun violence as a threat to the public health and they were for a long time not allowed to do that so maybe that'll change now so I don't know um, all right so let's talk about the AR-15 and the NRA if you go to their website they brag a lot about how awesome this gun is it was quite quite not fun going through and reading all of the things that you can do with um, with an AR-15 they're easy to clean. They're cheap. They're usually less than a thousand dollars. They're extremely light. They're the thing is is they're very easy to modify. Um, there are modifications to where uh, NRA is trying to protect what we call bump stock, and they're lobbying really hard to um, make bump stock protected under the Second Amendment. So the bump stock, what it does is this particular modification essentially converts this semi-automatic weapon to an automatic um, firing weapon. So while this is considered semi-automatic, you add a bump stock, it starts shooting out bullets similar to that of an automatic weapon. Um, so the AR-15, because it's cheap, easy to clean, pretty foolproof, easy to shoot, tears through people kind of easily, um, and can be easily converted to similar um, firing mechanism as an automatic weapon. There's a reason why it's the choice of mass shooters. They don't have to spend a lot of time loading it. They can spray more bullets. It's cheap and it's easy to modify. 
Even if bump stock was banned, you can do the same conversion with a small piece of metal and file. So that's the thing. It's easy to modify. Um, any semi is easy to convert if you have knowledge in a grinder. That's what I'm saying. So we kind of have to have that dialogue of saying, do we really need semi-automatic weapons? <laughs> it's, what purpose do you have for something that can do that much damage to an individual? Um, so the NRA currently reports that 5 million people in the U.S. own AR-15s. <laughs> no one would be allowed in my house if they had a gun, man. So in 2004, um, the ban on assault weapons was lifted, allowing purchase of these particular rifles. So in during the Clinton administration, I believe it was back in 98, he put a ban on assault rifles, and then when it was time for it to re-up in Congress, they just kind of let it go. And the reason being, well, part of the reason is that um, the sales, <laughs> the sales, once the ban lifted, soared with these AR-15s. Now, this was likely, the ban was likely allowed to lift because at the time that um, Clinton signed the assault ban into, into law for that period of time, Democrats, Democrats lost the majority of the seats in the House and in, you know, overall in Congress. And so there is some speculation that it was allowed to be lifted because of the fact they lost control of the House and Senate. So, um, since the recent mass shooting, Sandy Hook, Orlando, and such, this particular ban on assault weapons has been in, reintroduced into Congress with no reinstatement of it, regardless of the fact that the majority of the U.S. now wants gun control. Um, after each mass shooting, here's another interesting thing. After each mass shooting, sales of AR-15s increase. Um, so this, this is kind of a scary thing. Um, we see an increase of these sales after every single um, mass shooting. We know that Congress has banned them before, um, and then when the ban lifted, they, they just haven't reinstated it. But we have mass shootings now associated with these assault rifles. So you, you have to kind of take it into perspective, you know, okay, um, what are we doing here? So something I want to point out a bit. <laughs> All right. Um, I kind of want to take a minute to talk about other countries. <laughs> I know how many, you know, it's like our love of guns. Are we going to have this toxic love affair with, with weapons and, and this need to where they, people feel like it's for their protection? What are they protecting themselves from? And if they, if, if they truly need it for protection, why do they have to have assault rifles. I, you know, that, that really, that really doesn't make sense. All right. So let us talk about how other people in the world do things. <laughs> All right. So in other countries, in other countries, the number of gun murders per capita in the U S in 2012. All right. That was the most recent year in this particular and for these particular statistics. So this is from 2012. Um, it was nearly 30 times that than in the UK at 2.9 per 100,000 compared to just the 0 0.1. Of all the murders in the U.S. in 2012, 60% were by firearms compared with 31% in Canada, 18.2% in Australia, and just 10% in the UK. All right, so... As many people that die annually from gunfire in the U.S., that the death toll between 1968 and 2011, so all of the people that have died from guns in 1968 to 2011, eclipses all wars ever fought by our country. We have lost more people in gun violence between two, 1968 and 2011 than all of the wars combined. Um, now, according to PolitiFact, there are about 1.4 million firearm deaths in that period compared with 1.2 million U.S. deaths in every conflict from the War of Independence to Iraq. Um, 
so we're looking at the War of Independence all the way to the Iraqi War 2012. We have officially lost more people from gun violence than in wars. So, um, <laughs> suicide, yes, suicide as well. And some people were bringing up the fact about the school shootings. There was 18 of them so far just in 2018 in the past, since January. That is including suicides that happened on campus, whether in the um, parking lot, in the restroom. It's also including any time a gun was fired, whether it, you know people were injured or not. And I find it really interesting when people um, <laughs> hop over my social media and they're like, that's misleading. 18 school shootings. If you fire a gun in a school, that's a shooting. Just because people didn't get killed that day doesn't mean it's any less traumatic. So you have to kind of understand that um, when we're dealing with school shootings, anytime a gun's fired, whether it's accidentally on purpose or for whatever reason, that is indeed a shooting. Hello. Hello, everyone. So when we're looking at other countries, let's, let's take a look at this. I mentioned before that the World Health Organization has said that the U.S., we have just as much mental illness as everybody else in the world. All right. We're not exempt from that. Nobody else has less mental illness than we do. We're all about the same. But the thing is, is we have more mass shootings than any other country. And a lot of these combined. So it's not mental illness. A lot of countries have strict gun laws, those being UK, Japan, and Australia. And they don't have the same problems we do. They have minimal mass shootings. So we kind of have to ask, you know, maybe stricter gun laws may not eliminate the problem altogether, but it's certainly not a bad idea, is it? <laughs> so um, making it a bit more difficult to get a gun isn't necessarily a bad thing. So let's take a look at what other countries have done. Australia actually had a buyback program where their citizens could sell their guns to the government and that seemed to work. Japan requires a ridiculous amount of rigorous tests in order to own a gun. And um, they seldom have more, um, let's see, they, ha they, they have maybe no more than like 10 shooting deaths a year. That's Japan. And that's a population of 127 million people. Um, despite having roughly of a third of the guns, all right, Norway, Norway has about a third of the guns as the U.S., and, but they have a, about a tenth of the gun deaths. Now, there are um, sociologists who kind of study the Nordic model of things, and they found that there's this social cohesion between citizens um, in, Nor in Norway, for example. The police officers fatally shoot people fewer times in nine years than the U.S. police do in a day. So we have in Norway more highly trained officers who don't shoot people so often, fewer times in nine years than the U.S. police do in a day. So in 18 years, they would have shot as many people as the U.S. does in two days. Um, so we've got that. The U.K has implemented a lot of the same strategies as Australia, Japan, and Norway integrated together, and they're doing pretty well. So if we're looking at these others as models, education, training, accountability, rigorous tests, they lead to responsible gun ownership. So we should make it difficult. Um, and I was having a conversation with a friend of mine earlier today from the UK. He's a, he's a veteran. He was telling me a bit about what those individuals have to do in order to qualify to be able to shoot a gun in their military. And I'm just sitting there going, wow, there's so many rigorous tests. Now we have to kind of think about um, Bobby down the street who has an AR-15 is not required to undergo the same rigorous tests as law enforcement or the army or the marines or the navy seals or you know the fbi or the cia 
they're not going to have the same training that's required of these other individuals in order to actively respond in a stressful situation. And so we kind of need to put it in a bit of that perspective. We have people with access to these guns that are not held to the same accountability and responsible aspects of things as we hold our military to. Um, and other countries hold people with such weapons at a higher accountability rate. So we kind of need to kind of look at that and, and say, all right, I understand people want to be able to protect themselves, but if you're going to have war weapons that are sim that you would use in combat in war situations, they should be required to have a lot of the similar training. I mean, I, I think that's fair. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so glad you guys are here talking about this. Now I'm going to talk about the lovely, lovely group that we all love to hate, or a lot of people do, the NRA. <laughs> we should come up with names for the NRA other than the National Rifle Association. <laughs> okay, so here are here's what we got from um, PolitiFact. And this is the source of the Center for Responsive Politics for this particular thing. The NRA contributes a lot of money to campaigns lobbying. They're also lobbying for bump stocks, which allow rapid fire similar to that of automatic weapons, which we talked about. It's a modification of the AR-15. If you add up all of the money that the NRA has contributed um, since 1998, we're looking at $203.2 million in political activities. In just 2016, they have, don they have um, given almost $60 million in just 2016. Um, the NRA is also funded heavily by, um, by people. Uh, people who are associated, but a small percentage, you'd be surprised, a small percentage of gun owners actually are members of the NRA. It's not huge. I believe it's like around 19%. I will find that source for you. Um, in this particular graph, like I said, it's um, the Center for Responsive Politics. And this comes to us from Politico. They kind of broke everything down for us in this regard. Um, now, if you're curious about my sources, I will go back through and I'll put a list on these slides. I post all of my slides on my website, scientistmail.com, and, and you can download them yourself. You can use them for your own purposes. Just give me a little bit of credit. If you're a teacher and you want to use this in your classroom, it's absolutely okay by me that you do that. I don't mind. That's kind of what I do. I'm a science communicator, and I want people to be able to use this to kind of help, you know, spread the word you know we gotta we we have to accept facts for what they are this isn't a fun topic it's not it's not something anybody likes to talk about i've lost followers over the past few days because they're like oh this isn't fun you know and sometimes you have to kind of unplug yourself from topics like this because it can really drain you and make you feel bad but the fact remains these are the statistics, you know, these, these are, these are real numbers. These, these aren't made up. These we're killing people. We've, we've lost more life from gun violence since 1968 than all of the wars combined since our country was founded. This is something that's real. And, you know, if we're going to have guns, we need to be able to talk about what, what this is. Um, so solutions. Solution. So that Giffords Law page, giffordslaw.org, that talks about um, gun violence and um, the loopholes and things that we can do to fix it. What are some things that would kind of help with policy options that we could consider as new legislation to kind of help us with this gun issue? Okay. Universal background checks on all firearm purchases. Just do it. Just do it. Background checks for everybody. You know, if you if you drink and drive, you get your license taken away. Let's have background checks every few years just to make certain there's no criminal offenses. Now, if the state requires a permit or certificate for the purchase of a firearm, 
the permit or certificate does not exempt the holder from a background check, okay? If you have a if you have a certificate or a permit to conceal carry, some states say you don't have to have a background check for that. We still need to have those for every single one. If there's any transfer of firearm, if you sell it to another person, gun shows, any of that, that should be prohibited until background checks are processed. Um, now, the background check needs to have several aspects to it, right? We need to make certain that people who are not harmful, you know, don't have domestic violence abuse backgrounds, drug backgrounds, you know, criminal backgrounds. There was a person, you know, one of the, one of the mass shooters had a dishonorable discharge because domestic violence background while he was in the military that just kind of got swept under the rug. So background check process, it needs to have all relevant in state criminal records, federal criminal, criminal records, mental health records, juvenile delinquency records, warrants, and any other protective order information. Does he have a restraining order? Does she have a restraining order? Um, you know, or do they have a drug problem? Things like that. So we need to consider all of these things. So a person who wants to purchase a firearm, they must disclose relevant mental health files. Now, with that said, one in five U.S. adults have mental health issues. Depression, anxiety, you know, what the heck ever. But just because you have a mental health issue does not mean you're dangerous. So with that said, we need to understand that not everybody who has a mental health issue is going to be a problem. So that needs to be worked in. Um, now, again, any alcohol, drug abuse, that's important. We need to know that. Um, so, and that also needs to be reported to federal and state databases for prohibited purchases. We need people that are on watch lists, not gaining access to weapons, because that's another loophole. Um, criminal history info, relevant juvenile delinquencies, warrants, all of this, we need to have it on there. Now, the fee for a background check, the fee for a background check needs to be set at least at a level sufficient to cover administrative costs. Not $10 background check, that's not gonna be enough. It needs to be high enough to where it can cover all aspects of going through these particular processes. We need a ban on assault rifles. There is no reason for anybody to have a weapon that can be modified to an automatic weapon so easily. Um, and the NRA's websites brag about the AR-15 for um, how easy it is to modify. So it's worse than that for mental health. According to 2016 health survey data, approximately 12 million people have mental, severe mental problems that would warrant hospitalization. Well, what I read from NAMI.org, N-A-M-I.org, it's one in 25 have severe mental health issues. Um, and then proof of substantial training. <laughs> we need people to um, have shown that they've gone and gotten substantial training, not over a weekend at Bubba's gun range and fun times, shoot them out, whatever. We need substantial proof of training by licensed individuals that have had, you know, gone through their own certification processes and that sort of thing. So these are things that we can consider for solutions. Buyback programs for AR-15s, buyback programs for assault rifles. Yeah, that's gonna cost us a bit of money, but, you know, buy them back from individuals rather than having to raid everything. Tax incentives, those sorts of things is what we can do. So we can kind of knock that out and we can address this. You know, if you're going to have a pistol or something for your own personal protection or a hunting rifle where you got like four shots in it, that's different. But assault rifles we don't really need those. Um, we don't have to get rid of all the guns, but we need responsible gun ownership. And there's no reason for us to have um, semi-automatic assault rifles. We don't need war machines. I, I don't quite understand why we have those. So this is the end of my talk. So I wanted to 
take whoop I wanted to take a moment and thank all of my patrons. I have new patrons. <laughs> I want to thank Tony, J Tony, James, Lauren, Jen, Carl, Melanie, Patrick, Daniel, Paula, got Daniel twice, Carrie, Circa, Keith, Zachary, Tony, Graham, Tristan, Jennifer, and Corey. These are people that have contributed to my efforts. They have access, early access to all of my podcasts. My Patreon is patreon.com slash scientist Mel. Um, it starts at a dollar a month. They help me keep the lights on. Because of them, I have my website. I'm able to stream to three different platforms now. I've been able to buy technology to put on better shows. All of my content is free for anyone. But if you can help me out, if all of, honestly, if all of my followers gave me a dollar a month, I could do this full time and I could travel to people's cities. That's, that's the reality. I could quit my industry job and I could travel to all over the world and all over the US at least people's classrooms and engage there. I could do talks, but I understand that's a dream in the future, but I'm here and all of my stuff is free. And if you can buy me a coffee or something, it's just like a dollar a month. And I do have rewards associated with that. And I'm working on my cognitive bias book. So my patrons will have early access to them as well. My cognitive bias and how it kind of affects us every single day. Could I survive on $360 a month? I have like 4,000 followers on Twitter. If they all gave me a dollar, a dollar a, a month, I could just do this full time and I'd have shows all the time. I'd have podcasts every day and I could write my book. And these are, you know, that's, that's life goals. <laughs> you didn't see any Patreon info. It's on my Twitter and it's also on my YouTube, but it's patreon.com slash scientist mill. You survive on 282 a month. Oh, wow. And you produce your own electric. That's really cool. So, where can you find me? All over the internet. <laughs> you were looking at YouTube subs. Yes. Well, and my Twitter followers. I also produce content there as well. And I have content on Facebook. I stream I, in scientistmail.com. My articles are there. I also have quizzes there to help you test your biology knowledge. I'm still writing some there. My articles are free for you to read and use. Um, I'm on Periscope, YouTube, and Facebook. So you can interact with me on any of these places. I'm also on Twitter. So that has been the science of gun violence. It's been pretty crazy. <laughs> you only need 1500 a month. Goodness. They killed your VA all the way. Ah, oh, that sucks. I know this has been like a bit of a long... Yeah, there's my Patreon. So, yeah. I, and I have rewards there. I also... I'm mailing out my cups to my winners soon. I have like mugs that I did for like a giveaway in December. I haven't forgotten about those people. I have months for you and I'm going to mail those out this month. It's been a pretty crazy month, but I do have stuff and I also have prints and things. Could we mention the Dickey Amendment? I'm not familiar with that one. I have to look that one up, but that's okay. <laughs> Shoot me a link about that, Doc, and then, you know, I can, I can talk about that a bit more next time. But this has been a pretty, this has been a pretty hefty start a merch store. I might, I have somebody working on a t-shirt for me that's kind of like Wonder Woman slash me, like doing science-y stuff, which is kind of cool. Be good to yourself. I'm trying to, um, you know, I have a full-time job now because unfortunately I don't make enough just doing this to keep the lights on. So I have to do science, science job. And then I come and I work on this as much as I can, but I got a good response about writing a book, so I'm writing a book on cognitive bias and um, how it affects our daily decisions, how we keep it in check, and how you can determine what your biases are. What are the tools you can use? Everybody has bias. That doesn't make us bad people. Having bias doesn't make you a bad person. Everybody has it, and there are some evolutionary advantages to having bias, but when it goes unchecked and runs wild, that's when we kind of run into the sexism and the racism and the stereotypes. And then we can also let that run wild. We end up hurting ourselves. So sometimes bias is useful. Oh, you sent me the piece about gun violence. I haven't had a chance to read that. I've been, I've literally spent the majority of my day 
writing this and I spent like a big old chunk of yesterday writing all this and I have about 40 sources associated with this particular show and I'll be certain to update all of those for you. So <laughs> go to my website scientistmel.com. I have my audio podcast there hashtag hey scientist Mel so you can download and carry audio version of me with you. <laughs> I suggest you employ logic and reason. Yes! <laughs> How dare we think things, right? You know, think things critically, too. So, <laughs> but if you like audio podcasts, you can find my audio podcast, hashtag Hey Scientist Mel. My patrons get early access to that and they get their own RSS feed. Um, I have one, the one up for Josie Glazias. She is current, she is actually a science journalist and we talk on climate change. That'll be live next week for the general population. It's currently up for my patrons right now. And then the next one I'm posting is a chat I had with PZ Myers, followed by Evo PhD, where we talk about science education and evolution. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so glad I got to talk to you guys this weekend. I wanted to do this particular video justice and I wanted to make certain I had all of the information together and so the pertinent stuff because there's a lot to sort through and there's a lot available um, and I posted some of the links of my sources on Twitter associated with this video so you can look there and then I will post my additional sources on my website scientistmail.com so thank you guys for hopping on here this was so much fun and I'm so glad you got to be a part of this and I really am glad I get to share science with you guys this is the highlight of my weekend, being here with you. It is a tough subject, but I'm so glad that you guys got to share this with me and interact here. So I won't eat up any more of your time. Come to Steam It and DTube. There are tags for science bloggers and vloggers. Okay, um, RSC227, shoot, are you on Twitter? Shoot me like links and stuff and I'll hop over there. <laughs> Stick to the facts. I don't know what else to do. <laughs> nice picture of you fangirling. <laughs> Support my work. Thank you. I appreciate it. I feel even though I'm in industry science now, the educator hasn't left me. And given the current atmosphere that we have in the U.S. in regards to science denial and problems with accepting facts, it's important that we address that. And, you know, make science accessible for everyone. I hope you have a great, great night, guys. Have a super awesome day, and I'll see you guys around. <laughs>